Joan, it is so great to have you with us here at See Here Love. Welcome to Canada. <laughs> oh, I love Canada, and I, I'd do. love to be open. Yes, I do. Yes, I what, honestly do. Where have you been in Canada? Well, it's it's from the heart. Uh, after oh. my biological father died when I was three, my mother began to date uh, a Quebecois, and he wanted oh. to marry her. And she wanted to marry him, but she said she would not take her baby out of the country. You see, war was war was hanging over our heads. And she said, I love you and I love Canada and I'd love to be a Canadian. She said, but I will not take my baby out of this country at this time. Wow. Okay. So, so there you go. There. Okay. Oh, it's a, it's a connection of the heart and I've always yes. loved it. Joan, that's wonderful. Now... Joan, I know you have 50 simple practices for a contemplative and fulfilling life. Okay. And, and you have them in your wonderful book, The Monastic Heart. And I chose some of my favorites that I'd like to chat with you about. I went through them. I mean, if we could talk about all 50, that would be great. But we would, it might be a, it might be a five-part series, Joan, <laughs> podcast. But here's the book. Love right. your book. Um, so here's the, here, let's start with the first one. And maybe what we can talk about is, I love in the book how you explain what it is, kind of the practice of it. And so maybe you can help our listeners know that. So the first one I that really got me was, is it statio? Good girl. It, you it's made the a, giving a my whole self American to the present joy. moment. It, it, it couldn't be a better choice, Melinda, oh. especially for our culture at this time. Yes. It doesn't, it's not difficult uh, to figure out that you don't have to be a major language major, but when you look at the word that is a Latin word, statio, you're looking at what the American mind says, station, right, where we stop, the place where we stop. Mm -hmm. So I have, uh, and, and that's not easy. It's not easy for an American. I remember very well, I was a young novice and the um, novice director was taking us through the rule and uh, she said something like this, she, you know, the prayer, this um, looking into, the, into our own souls and, and trying to develop as we grow uh, is central to the Benedictine life. And uh, she said, now, young sisters, uh, prayer is at five uh, in the evening and you must be there at five to five. Pardon me? Wait a minute. Hold it now. Wait, what'd you say, sister? I said, prayer is at five, and you must be there at five to five. Uh, excuse me, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't go on. Could I ask a question? Yes, Joan, and what would you, I said, well, if prayer is at five, is prayer at five or is it at five to five? Which <laughs> one are we supposed to be there? And she said, prayer is at five, and you must be there at five to five. Hmm. <clears throat> Her answers weren't highly elucidating, at least not on the spot, but 10 years later, 15 years later, 20 years later, they became like a sweet ointment in life. What mm. does it mean? It means, Melinda, stop, honey. I know you just got off the metro. I know you're dead tired. I saw you throw your coat down on the, on the front bench. Oh, well, you did forget half of the briefcase. Oh, God. And they are going to call at 3 o'clock. And oh, man, what? And, and, and I have to get out there and start that souffle. Is it 3.50 or 4.50? Oh, man. Mm. Just press the button. No. No, the Benedictine says, Melinda, now sit down. Put your coat down. Drop the briefcase. You can smell it in the food in the kitchen. It's there waiting for you. That's the next thing you're gonna do, Melinda. That's the next thing. Now let's mm. get there. Close your eyes, sit still, five minutes, clear the static in your head. It's what the kids call getting your act together. I'm about to go make that souffle. I can't make it too, it'll, it'll get gummy. It'll ruin it. I know it. I can get it done at 400, but at 300, all the cheese will stay soft. I'll do 300. Stazio says, be where you are. Get where you're going and be where you are. 
Have you ever had a business meeting with somebody who every five minutes looks at their watch? Mm -hmm. right. Yes. They're not there. They're not there. The body has come, but the soul is nowhere near mm. your conversation. Mm. The mind is nowhere ready for anything you ask. This morning, I took a half an hour of Stazio before talking to you. I know you said, come on at noon. I don't want to come on at noon. I want this stuff to pour through my heart, to get into my head. To I, I mean, I've been in this community 69 years. Wow. And I'm still thinking it through. I'm still saying, I, I hear really good things about this Melinda Esther girl. She's worth taking the time to talk to. Hmm. I'm going to concentrate on this a little while. That's I appreciate what's that a lot. Working. That's what it's about consciousness. Mm. It's saying when you do something, first collect your mind and your heart. Concentrate on what you're doing. Don't just take this chitister thing and put a check mark in it. If you have eight things to ask, you get them asked. Concentrate. Concentrate. So good, Joan. I love that. I feel like I want that on a on a poster or something because, you know, as a content creator, as somebody out there, and you understand, like in film and in broadcast and in content, it's busy and people are constantly just going, going, going. And it's like you don't have time. I shouldn't say that. You know, you can always make the time, but we have that excuse of we're so busy, we got to keep going. We're literally doing multiple things at the same time on our phones and. And no wonder, even for myself and friends, we are stressed and anxious and exhausted and feel disconnected. So that, this that's rule, a good one. Melinda, was written in the 6th century, and we, have ne we now have neurologists in the 21st century telling us quite clearly that it is impossible. The human body is incapable of doing two things at once. Stazio huh. is where your heart and your mind and your place and your and your relationships come together. Without it, you're a fractured person for the rest of your life. And people will see the excitement and they'll see the fatigue and they'll see the exhaustion and they'll see the hard work. But what what, what they won't be able to see is what you can't see, and that's the inside of you that when we turn this thing off, we can look at one another and say, just like God said, and the, and it was good. Mm -hmm. That work was good. Good. Okay. The next one is metanoia. Ah, I, I'd have been I'd have been disappointed. The transformation of the self. That's it, right? It's not change. Hear the word. It's transformation. I'll give you a mm. short story. I have a okay. friend who years ago was the son of a, of a preacher. Poor kid probably had all church that he could stand for a while. And he's about 19 or 20 years, and here is his dad, you know, the, the, the local minister in, with the heart of Christ, and everybody loved the pastor. The kid had had it. He found the, the, the closest Harley or anything like it, climbed on it, and took off over the United States. He, he hit one bad hotel, one terrible party, uh, one line of uh, exotic dancers after another. Mm -hmm. And about two years later, he woke up staring at the ceiling in the cheesiest place in the middle of the country. And he said, just like the scripture says, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. I have wiped out my whole life. He got back on his bike. He rode all the way back to his family home where his dad was still the most loved pastor in, in the entire state. And he said, Dad, I just want you to know that I know that I was wrong. Nah, his father said, you're very right, Dad. Don't worry about it. This young man uh, went on. He, he went to a seminary and his father had nothing to do with it. He, he was ordained in the seminary and discovered, they gave him a little parish, and he discovered that just talking to small groups, all of it just wasn't what he thought ministry should be, and he became one of the best developers 
of spiritual materials that the United States had ever seen. That mm. was transformation. That's wow. what the Benedictine calls metanoia, being deep-seated, deep um, cavernlessly whole, mm. open to the self, and willing to tear off the masks. We all know what a mask is now. It's mm -hmm. a different kind of icon for us. And you, when you take it down and you know you've been posturing, you've been pretending. Everybody thinks I'm so happy in this job. Everybody thinks I'm, I'm absolutely made for it. Everybody thinks that I have no fear. Everybody mm -hmm. thinks that I, I was born to swallow that microphone. No. <laughs> no, no. We look at who we are and who we want to be, and we begin that process of transformation. And we take our friends and our family along with us. No, I'm not that anymore. No, it's not a job I do one. Yes, Dad, I know I can get paid more uh, doing that than training rescue dogs, but rescue dogs help people, and that's what I want to do. Hmm. That's transformation. That's good. That's medicine. That's so good. Joan, wow. Okay, one that I love, um, hospitality, which uh, I love in your book. It's communicate dignity and respectability to all people, especially oh, those that yeah. people don't want to associate with or the less of. Uh, hospitality. Okay. Yeah, and, and it, this is absolutely uh, the center of Benedictinism, quite characteristic of it. The little story that goes with that is this one. When the uh, Roman Empire fell and all the legions were brought home because they couldn't squeeze another penny of taxes out of the colonies, that meant that all the, Romes in the, all the roads in the, in the empire now were no longer safe. So here you had little families being beaten and raped and pillaged and burned and murdered everywhere. And here's this young man, Benedict of Nursia, and the disciples who heard these things from him and said, I want to live like that. And he said to them, uh, we, we, we have to do something for these people. And so they began to set up hospitality houses. What, what, I always forget this, but... But uh, who, who, was, who was the first um, um, well, well, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like being a Marriott. It's a Christian Marriott. It's a, the Benedictines were the first hospitality inns on the wow. globe. Huh. And they built these little homes. You can still, you, if you'll come thr through Erie, you can still call the monastery and say, could I have a room for the night? Could I go into Wonderful. one of the hermitages? Could I, go to, could I go to prayer with the sisters? Uh, would it be possible? And the answer is yes. Oh, absolutely. Please come. Yes, we're waiting for you. And so uh, that happens to be true of Benedict and communities everywhere. It is a sign. It is meant to be a sign of total acceptance. Mm -hmm. It's not those people and us. Right. It's not that race and them. It's us. And we owe one another this openness of heart. And if there's real openness of heart, honey, there is an open door to support it. Yeah. The next one, and that's a, it's, a, it's a perfect segue I love, and it's a, it's a word I, I use quite a bit. And my husband, Chris, and I have really been intentional and worked hard, Joan, on this one. But it's community the coming together of what you have here of unrelated people for the sake of a particular goal and mission. That's and, right. you know, Chris and I have been very intentional, but really blessed with incredible people in our lives. Um, like-minded people, different, not just like-minded, different people, people that kind of like challenge us and encourage us along. And so we've really worked hard at kind of building community. I know that's not okay. for everybody. A lot of people are, yes. have said to me, we don't have community. Uh, we're not a part of one. That's right. So what are your thoughts on that one? Because that, that's one of the uh, well, uh, you, practices for you all have of us. Just, you have just said it so well yourself. One of the, the things that distinguishes Benedictine communities uh, quite, quite um, 
deliberately and discreetly uh, among other religious communities in the world is that we all live together. Wow. We're a family of strangers. Hmm. And we do everything together. We do the decision making. We do the working. We do the outreach. What is community? Community enables us to do together what no one can possibly do alone. Mm, that's good. So we come together as strangers, 69 years, 69 years. This is my spiritual family. They're there. Uh, we have this little monastic uh, installation where we came to this city almost 200 years ago. And then in the course of it, moved out on East Lake Road. So we have a Benedictine Center here and a Benedictine Center there. And we all come together every weekend, every meeting, every whatever, like you and your family and your community do. And that companionship is where we find the wisdom in other people who are a direction for us. And we find out we're not alone. Mm -hmm. And we find out that we have something as a group to give together that we couldn't possibly. You and Chris are calling people to build a model of what this world can be and must be. Mm -hmm. We're still, I mean, you can see the forces of evil trying to tear us apart because they know that the spiritual community of any kind, and by spiritual I do not mean denominational, I mean those who live for the sake of, of uh, being the best human beings we can be together. Well, I can hardly watch television today to see those children on the border between Poland and, 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 and uh, Belarus. I mean, what kind of human beings are we? No. Community is what enables us to build human community to its ultimate, ultimate wow. and utmost. Good. Okay, Joan, we've got four more. You're good. I know. And I went through them because it was hard. I went through and I was going, okay, there's 50 and I was trying to pick one, but I'm like, okay, no, what, what just resonates with me? Okay. It, this is a good one because it's one that I'm, in, I'm challenged by. It's serenity. You also had silence, but yes. serenity, you've said it's inner peace. Yes. So let's talk about it. Cause I think everybody's like, Oh, we would love serenity. <laughs> Well, oh, how do you do that? What does that look like? Well, serenity is the moment at which you come to a sense of enoughness in life. Oh, wow. And when you have enough, when enoughness means more to you than excessiveness, hmm. when you have gotten to the point where you're tired saving money for the second boat, or for the, the third apartment, or uh, for uh, the, the big party, because what you'd really like to do is help other people feel as good about life and themselves as you do. So serenity enables us, uh, uh, enables our need to be peaceful you and I can't bring peace unless we are peaceful ourselves within us. And that means that we learn to accept the unknown, that we live with an attitude of faith. Yeah, this is a mess. Of course it's a mess. I mean, I'm not an idiot. I will tell you the truth. <laughs> this has been a mess. Yes. And we have lived through it together. Mm -hmm. And we have lived that with a sense of serenity. Nobody's had a great breakdown. Nobody is fighting anybody else because of it. And when you turn the television on and you see that you have a government that is now in great angst when they're not working together and they're proud that they're not working together, hmm. when they can destroy legislation that is meant for the safeguard of the people in this country alone, and they can do it in order to make a president look like a failure. You ask, where did this evil come from? Throw the rascals out. We'll start over again with people who want to bring two possible wonderful ways together. One set of, of, of work this way and one, and let's bring 
every piece of legislation through that Congress uh, with everybody in the country winning. No, we, Joe Biden will tell you, no, we are not going to get everything and every bill, but let's get what the people need, all the people, mm. all the people. Serenity mm. is the basis of human attain, uh, achievement and attain it, attainment, and uh, unless we have serenity and until we have serenity in our very government, we are doomed to our own failure. Okay, that's good. In that, one of the big things for my husband and I is this next practice of peace and justice, both personal and global. You, you talked a little bit about that in Serenity, but for someone listening, what does that look like? I mean, in our show, Joan, we talk a lot about peace and justice and standing up against injustice. We're yeah. all my heart for you know, my women viewers and listeners has always been about using our voice to stand right. up to the least of these, yeah. the marginalized and the yeah. oppressed always. Yeah. And, and very diverse voices and rep representing many cultures and stages and ages, but peace and justice as a practice. Yes. Uh, in the Benedictine tradition, there are two chapters in this book on peace, one on personal peace Mm -hmm. which approaches that uh, the, the last conversation on serenity, this ability to bring myself to calm, to, to faith, to acceptance, mm -hmm. uh, to the, the willingness to be able to um, accept even a kind of destruction without despair. Right. You know, I mean, look at those people who've been burned out and who say to you, we have to build again. We've lost everything. That's, that's an inner peace. That is, it just shakes the world to hear it. So there is an inner peace, and we gain that by, by um, confronting ourselves on the things that make us anxious or angry or upset. But there is that place in the Benedictine tradition where peace is part of the contract. The old uh, medieval monasteries always had one one thing plan, uh, over the over the entrance, and it said, "Peace to those who enter here." Pax in trantibus, peace to those who enter here. Come and live a peaceful life. But then, in the Middle Ages, when all of these little petty barons were were wiping one another out and and leaving the peasants with no skills, no food, no home, no place, that's when the Benedictines began to say, look, somebody has to address this question of how we come to universal peace. So believe it or not, Benedictines had an awful lot to do to, um, to, to the developing of a thing like um, the just war theory. In fact, I, I happen, you happen to hit a, a a chapter that I laugh. I mean, this is my best, my funniest chapter. <laughs> the Benedictines decided that because of all the holy days, now remember, um, Europe was basically Roman Catholic at that time. So you had all these feast days and you had all, all you had La At uh, Advent and Lent and mm -hmm. Easter and Christmas and the big major feasts. And so the Benedictines went to the table and said, well, you can't, you can't fight on Sunday. That's the Lord's Day. And you can't fight on Monday. That's Mary's Day. And you can't fight on Friday because that's the oh. day we should be fasting. So by the time the Benedictines finished it, there were 78 days left in the year when it was moral for people to fight. <laughs> now, it's a wonderful, I just, I love it. And I count those days and I know those days. But what those days are to us now, the wisdom of those days is the message it says, when you want to stop fighting, you can. Hmm. Don't tell me that you have to fight your way through this. You have decided yeah. to, and so you will. But when you decide to contribute to peace, you won't be doing that. You will be in groups trying to make peace. Hmm. That's good. I like that. Okay, two more. This is fascinating. I've never heard of this uh, before. Holy leisure. Or for some people, they say leisure. Rest in God's care and then also care for the world. Now, that's interesting. I've never heard of this holy, I mean, 
I wish I had known that before. I could have said to my parents as a teenager. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> Mom and dad. <laughs> It, it, it looks like I'm not doing anything, but because, but I really am doing something, and it's called Holy Leisure. Yes, you are. Yes, you are, and I'll tell you why. Holy Leisure is not play. Play is its own thing, and right. Benedict has play a lot. Yeah. We like playing, like everybody else. It's good yes. for the soul. It, it wipes out the cobwebs. It settles you down. It gives you laughs. It's terrific. Holy Leisure is that moment in Scripture when God, after... After creating uh, sun, moon, animals, stars, uh, food, trees, sits back and says, that's good. That was good. Holy leisure is that moment of concentration, of reflection on what I'm doing as a human being, what my community is doing as a social entity, what my state, my city, my president, what is everybody doing and I'm, I, my, it's based on a basic question, how shall we follow the gospel here? It answers the question, why is it that the poor are sleeping under bridges mm -hmm. in the coldest days of the winter in the richest country in the world? Mm. What are, we, we're standing back saying, is this good? Is my work contributing any good? And how? Mm. And what am I doing to, to make the good good? Not just uh, one more charity. Yeah. We, it's one thing to give. It's another thing to allow. You can give to the poor, but as long as we allow that kind of poverty, that kind of destitution, and we never say a word about it, we never send a, a, a card to, to a, a president or my, my so-called representative, we never gather uh, on the streets and say, no, we won't. We will no longer allow the poorest of the poor to be paid only $7.25 an hour mm -hmm. or serving the rest of us like dogs. No, we will not allow that. Yeah. That comes out of holy vision. I've thought it over. Fantastic. I know the evil and the pain of it. I will not support it, and I'll move in the opposite direction. Fantastic. Okay, our final one is, and you know, really connects because I know this, is the desert. It exposes our weaknesses, but leaves us, as you say in your book, leaves us full of hope. Now, some people are like, no, the desert is desolate. It's difficult. It's hard. It's lonely. <laughs> I'm parched. I'm thirsty. Um, but I, I like that in exposing the, fact the of the matter is, on with that. Yeah. The truth is that there is a desert in each of us. Hmm. What we grapple with spiritually is the desert in us. Mm -hmm. Something's missing in our lives. And uh, we, we get another hit someplace on a dark corner instead of asking, what am I really missing? Mm -hmm. I'm in this desert. I'm allowing these people to, quote, cure me with alcohol and, uh, and, and drugs with too much money and too little love, with too much love and too little care. Um, th this whole notion is, is the call to us to recognize our spiritual needs. Stand in front of a, of a mirror tonight, that's your desert, and say, what is my spiritual need? Where do I go to get it? God is not a prize to be won, the rule of Benedict says. You cannot win God. You cannot merit God. In his first chapter on humility, he says to you, what is unlike every other major denominational approach to the spiritual life, he says, you can't earn God. You already have God. Hmm. Trust that. Trust that. Now what? Now look at yourself. What do you lack in yourself? That's the big question for the first four degrees of humility. The next four degrees of humility are not uh, the first four are uh, what's my relationship with God? 
What do I have there? Do I have a relationship with God? Do I accept the fact that God is within me and calling me on? The next four degrees of humility is, who am I? Hmm. Am I am I showing off? Am I uh, posturing? Am I pretending to the world that I'm great and I have it all and they're nothing? Because if so, I have a couple things to learn. I have to I have to learn to expose myself to myself. Um, you know, uh, in, in Catholicism. Um, confession was always a big element. That that turned into a new industry called psychology and psychiatry. They're both good. They're all three good. It is, this is the call to me to expose myself to myself. I'm not the hotshot. And I can tell if everybody else got tickets for the banquet at the ta- at the high table, and I found my my ticket number is 36, and I don't like it, and I'm not going to go, or I'm leaving early. I'm getting a little message about who I think I am, and how I deal with other people, and what kind of a mask I am putting up between me and the rest of the world. And once I take care of wanting too much lying too often, refusing to grow, then I can look at the last four. There are three chapters on humility in this book. And this third one is about, uh, if you want to know who you are, ask yourself how you're treating or what you think about other people. It's that simple. It's that simple. And that will take you, that little trip will take you out of the desert. God's not a prize to be won. God is a spiritual force within us that is calling us to free ourselves from the chains that are binding us, our addictions, our egotism, our need for power and wealth and a sense of importance. Mm. It's out. We go out to the desert to break our own chains. Beautiful. You know, Joan, when, as somebody is listening and they're really struggling and they're like, okay, I, I hear you know, the eight simple practices I can do for a contemplative and fulfilling life. I know there's 50, but for someone struggling right now, two years into the pandemic, loss and grief, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what would you say to them to encourage them? I mean, obviously we can say it'd be great to look through these and begin practicing. Yeah, of course. But What's your encouragement to somebody who's just, wow, overwhelmed and struggling? In the very last chapter, I try to bring it together. I talk about the making of the the monastic monastic heart. heart. What's the stuff you make a monastic heart from? As you've pointed out so well, Melinda, I mean, there there are these separate pieces, Mm -hmm. and some of them will appeal to you, and you'll know you need them, and some of them you take for granted. But when you put them all together, it seems to me that this is what has to be left. The monastic heart uh, depends on the spirit of tradition. I'm not my own god. I'm not my own company. Uh, There's been wisdom a long time before me, and I have to seek it and understand it. Two, exactly what you talked about. The monastic heart carries with it and abides in it always the spirit of community. Who am I working with? What am I working for? How am I doing it? And and what what am I gaining from it myself? The third uh, element of the monastic card is the spirit of reflection. Think. Um, take yourself in holy leisure to that moment. And, and if you're upset, ask yourself, really, why? Why? Is it possible that the that the... The thorn of upset is in me, not outside of me. And if it is outside of me, how do I deal with it so it doesn't destroy me? Then uh, the the fourth element of the monastic heart is the spirit of personal growth. Keep growing. None of us are finished. It's going to be the last breath 
will be learning and also developing and becoming more of a gift to the rest of the world. The monastic heart also lives on a spirit of service. Uh, it's when I was a kid again, there's a line in the rule that says, let everyone, no matter how old or how infirm, be given a task. I said, what? My God, these people are cruel. They're going to they're gonna take 80-year-olds and give them a task. Yeah, you know what the task is? It's separating the mail or folding uh, the wash. Why would you give everybody a task? Because everybody is important to the importance of the community. Everybody, mm -hmm. which leads us then finally in the making of a monastic card after tradition, community, reflection, personal growth, service, the spirit of transcendence, that we're not the end of it. This is the beginning. We're in training. We don't know how or for what or who it is. We just know that life is about more than this. And we're going to stick around and find out what it is. Wow. <laughs> Joan Chichester. <laughs> Amazing. Wow, you are quite an inspiration. And, and so... I mean, these are good. I think everybody needs to pick up your book, The Monastic Heart, 50 Simple Practices for Contemplative and Fulfilling Life. And I think you're right. I think, you know, there's 50. And as I went through the book, I kind of like dog-eared pages and highlighted the ones that really resonated or that connected with me, but also ones that um, I know I need to work on a little bit yeah, more. That's the right. The serenity and silence, the, yeah, yeah. the humility one. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, well done. Uh, thank you for lending your voice and thoughts to us, and so appreciated uh, it's, this time. It's, so good. It's people. It's people like you, Melinda. In all honesty, who 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 are providing the the spiritual basis for important thinking in our own lives. Without you, I, the number of uh, of program directors that I have talked to in the last three months. Have, have touched my heart deeply, mm. and this one today has been superb. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you so much. Joan, it was a pleasure, and it was great meeting you as well. Hopefully our, our paths will cross again. I hope so, Melinda. Yeah. I'm going to look for you, pal. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, honey. God bless you.